2 Samuel chapter one this morning. 2 Samuel chapter one. You remember the chapter breaks, all these things were added much later. The book of Samuel is one book. Uh, it got the fourth century, the scrolls got too long. We gotta add another scroll, so they, the second Samuel. But, but I think the division is pretty appropriate. Um, we have seen uh, Saul uh, come to the end of his life, and, and David doesn't know that yet. Um, but you see in all of First Samuel, you see uh, God raising up David, but in many ways he's not raising him up. God's bringing him low, isn't he? Uh, God is, is, is working in David's life to mold him and shape him more and more to the, to the image of Christ. He's bringing him low. He's breaking him down so that he can build him back up into the man that God wants him to be. In fact, we see what is the purpose of Saul to some extent because you think about this, and I'm sure David thought about it more than, on more than one occasion. God, if you've anointed me a king, why don't you just eliminate Saul really early and make the whole process much more simple. Why wouldn't God do that? Why does God keep Saul around? Because God has a purpose for Saul, and that's to use this defiant, rebellious king to shape David into who he wants him to be. God uses a defiant king to accomplish his purposes in David's life, and when God is done with Saul, he removes him. And now the pathway has become clear, and, and David will begin his ascent to the throne. And we talk a lot about, we talk a lot about how you finish. Um, finishing well is critically important. But I also tell you this, how you start's pretty important too. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. This is, as we turn the page into 2 Samuel, this is the beginning of David's ascent to the throne. And what we want to know is what will be the foundation of his kingdom. What will be the foundation of David's reign? And what we're going to see here very clearly in this first incident is that this is a man that the foundation of his kingdom is going to be righteousness, the word of God, and a love for truth. And he's going to be a worshiper. He's going to be love, he'll love the Lord. We're going to see these marks of his kingdom and, and God's going to begin to work. You're going to get to chapter 10 and 11, and, and David, it's going to be Camelot for Israel. The Gentiles are going to be coming to him, wanting to learn more about this God that they serve. But also this, as he begins his kingdom, I think the question that's going to be answered, and in some extent it mimics, we're going to talk about this in a moment, but it mimics the beginning of Christ's ministry. And it's the question of this, how do you enter into the kingdom? How do you enter into the kingdom? On what basis do you come? Because this is the first, we're going to see here, the first Gentile coming to the Jewish king to know the blessings of God's people. How do you enter? It's a very important question. We're going to see the establishment of David's kingdom and on what basis is it established. With that in mind, let's pray together. We'll work our way through this text. Father, bless the study of your word this morning. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is your living, inerrant, active word. Pray that it would penetrate our hearts. It would draw us closer to you. And Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that doesn't know you, you would convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. God, they'd see the depth of their sin, they'd see the beauty of their Savior, and they would cry out for mercy and grace that they might know your salvation, the blessings of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, look with me at verse one. It says, now it came about after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, that David remained two days in Ziklag. So he goes back, you remember, he's been rescued. Um, he's now, based on the spoil of his victory, he's become very wealthy. All that he had lost has now been uh, restored to him. He heads home, he's now at Ziklag. It's not really home, we've talked about this, but, but it's as much a home as he has at this moment. Uh, I don't know what he's really gone home to. We know that everything had kind of been destroyed or burned down. But here he is, I think, hopeful about what the future might bring. In the midst of this, if we want a little bit more information about what's occurring at Ziklag, we've got to turn over to 1 Chronicles. We're not going to do so this morning for the purpose of time, but I would encourage you for your own personal study to look over into 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Because in the midst of this time in Ziklag, God is drawing uh, men to him, 
God is growing uh, David's army. In many ways, it's like revival is occurring there at Ziklag. And, and is, is in the past, when he was at the cave of Adullam, and God is kind of drawing out the outcasts and the rejects, now these mighty men, in fact, in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it says that the sons of Issachar, men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. These men were responding to David. Uh, in other words, there were men who recognized that Saul is going down and David is ascending and he's God's anointed king. And now is the time to respond to the Lord's anointed. Now is the time to bend the knee to his lordship because while he may not be fully established right now, he will be someday. And we're going to trust him. Do we need sons of Issachar today? Yes, men who understand the times, meaning we understand that Jesus is king and we are drawn to him and we bend the knee to his lordship and we make him our savior knowing that while he is not today been fully established as king, he is God's king and his kingdom will be established. And so David is kind of revivals occurring in, in Ziklag, and he stays there for two days. A lesser man would have seen the great army that's gathering with him and said, we're going after Saul. I don't know what's left of his army, but we're going to take the kingdom by force. But he remains there for two days, and as we've seen with David, so it will continue to be that the motto of David's life that I continue to keep in front of me is that I will be who God wants me to be when God wants me to be it. David knows in his life, and he's learned this the hard way, my job is simply to be faithful. Let God work out the time and the dates and the sequences of, of his plan. I'm just going to be faithful today. So he remains there in Ziklag two days, waiting upon the Lord. Well, in verse 2, as he's waiting there in Ziklag, it says, On the third day, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And it came about when he came to David that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. So here we see, David doesn't know it's an Amalekite at this point, but we see a Gentile comes to David. We've seen Israelites come to David, but this is the first non-Israelite to approach the, the king of Israel desiring the blessings of God. He doesn't immediately reveal himself. He uh, comes anonymously. He comes cautiously. He comes with his clothes torn, dust on his head. What is that a picture of? He comes with grief. He comes mourning. Assumably, he's uh, mourning the, the loss of the Israelite army to the Philistines. He falls to the ground. He, he prostrates himself. He, he comes in humility, demonstrating the honor of the, the king of Israel. He comes with a heart of contrition. He comes with a humble heart. He comes with the outward demonstration of great pain. Pain because Israel is lost and the enemies of God's people, the Philistines, have won. Now, he comes somewhat cautiously because, as we'll find out later, he is an Amalekite. And we've talked about this so much, but it's worth repeating again. The, the, the Amalekites were descendants of Esau. They are the enemies of God's people. They're the Edomites. In fact, we have a, a, a prophet, Obadiah, whose sole purpose is to pronounce judgment upon the Edomites and the Amalekites. You remember, we've talked about this, but in the Exodus journey, it was the Amalekites who preyed upon the, in the Exodus journey, on the Israelites who straggled behind. They were cruel. They were mean. Moses fought against them and said, we'll, we'll never have peace with these people. It's, it's in the book of Esther that there's a man who attempts a genocide on the people of Israel, and his name is Haman, and he is an Amalekite. So all throughout the Old Testament, the, uh, the Amalekites are viewed as the enemies of God's people. Now let me just ask you a question. Does this sound familiar? Here is a guy who is far off. He is not uh, by nationality a part of God's chosen people. He is a foreigner. He is a Gentile. He is an enemy of God. He's an object of God's wrath. He's a son of disobedience, but he comes to the Lord's anointed David in humility and contrition. Should sound a little bit like us. 
a people who uh, cannot trace our, unless you're Jewish, cannot trace your lineage back to Abraham. And we're far off and we're in our sin. We're an enemy of God and we're an object of wrath. But to our, our King Jesus, we come in humility. So we look at this guy at least initially. I don't know about you, but I look at this guy and say, we're doing pretty good. He's checking the boxes. Looks good. Well, let's move on. Verse 3, then David said to him, from where do you come? And he said to him, I've escaped from the camp of Israel. Where are you from? Where would you come from? And he says, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. This is a very smart guy. He says, I've been in the camp of Israel. In other words, he's letting David know, I associate with Israel. I associate with the one true God of Israel. This is a man who obviously knows uh, that, uh, as it says of Israel, those who bless you, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. So he comes letting David know, listen, you, you need to know, I'm friend, not a foe. I am a guy who's associating with Israel. Uh, you remember Naaman the leper, the Syrian commander in the Old Testament? Uh, he hears about, he's got leprosy. He hears about a guy who can heal people in Israel named Elijah. And he goes to Elijah seeking uh, healing. And uh, he, he brings what? He brings a lot of wealth. And he wants to buy healing. And you remember Elijah said, you don't buy the healing of God. You, you don't buy salvation. He's given to you a free gift, but you got to do something. You got to take a bath. But you can't just go to any river. You got to go where? You got to go to Jordan. You got to go to Israel's river. Remember, he gets mad, doesn't he? We got better rivers back in Syria. But the acknowledgement of God in the Old Testament is if you want to know God's salvation, you don't go to any God. You go to the one true God of Israel. You go to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the only means of salvation. So this guy has some understanding that I'm going to associate with Israel, and he's seeking to gain favor with David. Well, let's look on. Verse 4, David said to him, how did things go? Please tell me. And he said, the people have fled from the battle, and also many of the people have fallen and are dead, and Saul and Jonathan and his sons are dead also. So David continues on, how did things go? You've, you've come, you've escaped the camp, what happened? And it's interesting to me because in David, uh, is, his asking this question, in many ways he's revealing his heart. He, he's revealing what he is concerned with most. Because I'll be honest with you, if I had been David and I find somebody who's escaped the battle, the first question that I am going to be asking is what? Is Saul dead? That's what would have been primary on my part because that's been the thorn in my flesh that's prevented me from achieving the position that God's called me to. And yet what David demonstrates in asking this question is that his primary concern is not about his position or status within the kingdom of God. His primary concern is the people of God, the name of God, and the glory of God. Now that's a pretty good man, isn't it? A man who's not looking out for his own interests, but for the interests of God. The, the, a man who isn't concerned about his position, but the name of God, the reputation of God, the glory of God, and the people of God. It reminds us of somebody else, doesn't it, that uh, was self-sacrificing, selfless, who did not focus on his own interests, but put the interests of others above his own to the point of being obedient to death, even death on a cross. David is, in many ways, pointing us to Christ. In fact, Jesus will be called the son of David. And so here is David demonstrating, it's not about me. Again, I'll be who God wants me to be when he wants me to be. it. My primary concern is the people of God and the, the glory of God. Well, the guy says, um, many have fled, many have died. And you remember there at the end, he says in verse 4, Saul and Jonathan are also dead. There's so many comparisons, we don't have time, but you remember when the, the report of Eli 
Um, the report given to Eli by the runner who comes to him, reports of the battle that's occurred. He tells them, but he, he, he saves that, that information about Eli's sons to the very end of the report in a similar way. This man saves that to the end, probably knowing that this is what David would have been most interested in. And what he has revealed to David strategically at this point is that David, the path has now become open. The way for your ascension to the throne is completely clear. Saul and Jonathan are dead, and I think I mentioned this last week, but this is significant because if, if Jonathan remains alive, there would have been some tension in the nation because Jonathan was the descendant of Saul. He would have been the rightful heir to the throne according to the nation. Um, and even though Jonathan has already demonstrated loyalty to David, to some extent it would have been out of his control because the nation would have looked at Jonathan, this great man who is now next in line, and there would have been some, some conflict, some tension, and even though there's gonna be some tension between Ish-bosheth, it would have been much greater if Jonathan had still been alive. And so to some extent in God's mercy, and I think if you'd asked Jonathan, Jonathan, what do you desire? I think Jonathan would have said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And so Saul and Jonathan have died in battle and the path is now clear. Verse five, so David said to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? I even begin to see some skepticism in David's heart here. I'm not sure about this guy. I want some proof. You've, you've brought some very significant information that's significant to the nation, it's significant to my, my, my uh, reign. What proof do you have? I, I think to some extent he's wondering if, if everybody died, why didn't you die? Why are you still standing here? How'd that happen? I want some proof. Look at verse six. The young man uh, who told him said, by chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa and behold Saul was leaning upon his spear and behold the chariots and the horsemen pursued him closely and he looked behind him, he saw me and, and called to me and said, here I am and he said to me, who are you? And I answered him, I'm an Amalekite. And then he said to me, please stand beside me and kill me for agony has seized me because my life still lingers in me. So I stood behind him and killed him because I knew that he could not live, live after he had fallen. I took the crown which was on his head and the bracelet which was on his arm and I have brought them here to my Lord. David asked a pretty simple question. How, did, how do you know this? You're telling me that Saul and Jonathan are dead. How do you know and I think if this Amalekite had uh, left his answer uh, more simple, he probably would have been in a much better situation. If he had simply said, I, I saw it with my own eyes, I saw him lying there on the field of battle as dead, if he had left it more simple, that would have certainly been enough. But he continues to run his mouth. Uh, <laughs> Can we not endanger ourselves when we just keep talking? And so this guy's gonna hang himself as he begins to give way more information than he should have, but he will do so with an ulterior motive that we're gonna find out David will see right through. See, this guy doesn't wanna just give an account. He wants to impress David. He wants to paint a better picture of himself. He wants to embellish the story, and to some extent, he will even deceive and lie about the circumstances to make himself look better than he really is. If you remember the story, the account of Saul's death in chapter 31, uh, scripture makes clear that uh, Saul dies by suicide. He falls on his own sword. This man is reporting that he actually killed Saul. I think that is a lie on this guy's behalf. There's some uh, discrepancies between the commentary, whether he's lying or there's just more to the story. I think he's lying. I think in his heart he wants to impress David and say it was a mercy killing. I helped you. I'm the one. I'm responsible. I have paid the way for you to be king. And I did it out of mercy. I did it out of the request of the king. He wanted me to do it. It was a mercy killing. And he does so to make himself look better than, than he really is. In order to gain the favor of David, in order to know the blessing of God's people, in order to know the blessings of the nation. And yet here is the, the grave miscalculation that he makes. He does not understand, and in fact, he underestimates the anointed king that stands in front of him. See, because the fact of the matter is, any other king, any ordinary king probably would have heard this story and he would have 
thrown a great festival and says, thank you, you have really done me a great service. You have opened the way and paved the path for my reign, for me to become king, and here you have. You brought the, the crown, the bracelet to me as the spoils of victory. We're gonna have a party, and he would have thrown his arms around him and given him the best seat at the meal and maybe given him a position within his cabinet, and this man would have gone, gone, known great wealth, and that's exactly what he was expecting. Certainly, David will not respond in the way that he expected. Listen to me, not in a million years could this man have anticipated how David would respond. Look with me in verse 11. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them, and so also did the men who were with him. They mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for the people of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Now, now, put yourself in this man's shoes. You've, you've told this story uh, to make yourself look good. You're anticipating that David's gonna hear, that Saul, that, that's all that David's gonna be concerned about. That's all that David is gonna hear. He'll be, he'll be very little concerned with the details of how it occurred. He'll just know this guy has killed him, and that has paved the way, and, and, and that's, that's put me in a good position, and he'll rejoice over it. But David doesn't respond that way. Put yourself in the shoes of this guy as David begins to tear his his clothes and grief. And he's probably thinking to himself, this is not going as I thought it would. David is not responding as I anticipated him to respond. David is no ordinary king. His own position and status is a, no real concern at this moment. His concern is the glory of God, the people of God, and his, his heart breaks for what breaks the heart of God. Make no mistake about it, God, God took Saul's life. But in the same way, know this, God took no gleeful delight in the execution of his will. One of the things that we know about God is that God takes no delight in the death of the wicked. Does God glory in his justice? You bet he does. Does God glorify himself in the punishment of the wicked? You bet he does. But scripture says he takes no gleeful delight in it as though he's a God who rejoices in the death and the punishment of the wicked. No, the picture that we get is that even though God glorifies himself in the execution of his judgment, he's a God who breaks, his heart breaks for the wicked who will not receive him. And I think the heart of David is, God would not rejoice in this and neither will I. David is gonna demonstrate here the heart of God. And in that way, he will lead his people to be obedient to the Lord. God help us to be a people who have the heart of God that we don't delight in the judgment of the wicked. Please don't misunderstand me. We do delight in the justice of God. We delight in a God who is just and who will bring ultimate punishment. But we don't delight in the, the wicked perishing in the punishment of hell. No, it breaks our heart and it drives us to tell people about the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, be very careful about the person who gets too excited about the downfall of the wicked, even when it's advantageous to their own cause. The heart of David is, what did Lincoln say? Charity towards all and malice towards none. The other thing I think it's important for us to see here is that David, David grieves. Certainly, I think there's some, some portions of David's memory of Saul that were good. And certainly, he had a deep connection to Jonathan, a friendship with Jonathan that, that he had with no other person that was encouraging to him, and when he receives the news of their death, his heart is grieved. This is important for us as believers to hear because I think sometimes we, we borderline too much on the celebration of death. Now, don't get me wrong. We celebrate a, a God who has overcome the grave and defeated the grave in Christ's resurrection and gives us hope of eternity with him. And we know that death is not the end, but the beginning. But at the same time, listen to me, as believers in Jesus Christ, even we, when someone dies in our life and we see what sin has accomplished in the death of that person, our hearts are grieved. 
That death is not a part of God's original design. That death is a result of sin. And it is ugly and it is painful and it hurts. Did David know the hope of Christ? You bet he did. He says, my heart also rejoices. My flesh will also dwell securely. For you'll not abandon my soul to shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. David knew the hope of a resurrection, but at the same time, in the moment of losing somebody he loved, he still grieved. And remember, there's somebody greater than David in the New Testament who when he came to the moment of death, the death of his good friend Lazarus. Did Jesus know the hope? (laughs) Oh yeah, I think he did. Did Jesus know what was gonna happen? Oh, I think he did. But what did it say of Jesus when he approached the death of Lazarus? Number one, it says his soul was troubled. You know the initial reaction of Jesus in the confrontation of Lazarus' death? When it says his heart was troubled, it means he got mad. I think sometimes in the face of death, that's our initial reaction, we're mad. But Jesus isn't mad at God the Father, he's mad at the product of sin. That this is never the way things were intended to be. This is what sin has done to the glory of God and the image of man. And he was mad, and then it says he he wept. And listen to me, that word wept there that it uses of Jesus doesn't mean that he was like, oh, it's a little bad day. No, it means he grieved intensely. Let this be a reminder to us. We, listen, I hope there's some people that shed a few tears at my funeral. I mean, if we've done our job, if we've been the representation of Christ in somebody's life, I hope we'll be missed. God help us if nobody's really missing us. We grieve, but scripture tells us we do not grieve as those who have no hope. It doesn't say we don't grieve because we have hope. It says we grieve, but not as those who don't have hope. We have the hope of Christ, just as David did. But grief is very real, and we see it here, even in David's life, a righteous man who who loved the Lord. Then finally, I don't have time to really tell this too hard, But you know what I think is amazing about this? Saul was the cause of so much pain in David's life. And yet, you could make an argument to some extent in the Psalms, but in the record of David's life that we have in 1st and 2nd Samuel Chronicles, at no place in there do you see David holding a grudge against Saul. That to me is powerful. David knew what it was to forgive. This man has hurt me. It's been painful. But I know God's sovereign. And I will not hold a grudge. And when it comes to the moment of his death, we're going to grieve. We're going to grieve the loss of a man that God appointed for his purposes. David grieves. He leads the nation to grieve. Look at verse 13. David has kind of settled down now. It's later in the evening. They've been fasting. Um, And I think David's attention begins to turn back to this guy. I'm curious about this guy. Something's not adding up. Something doesn't appear to be right with this guy. Um, I, I I need to revisit this. We need to dig a little deeper. And so he goes back and he asks another question. In verse 13, David said to the young man who told him, where are you from? I want to know, not location. Where do you come from? Who are you? He's digging deeper, and he says, I'm a son of an alien, a Malachite. So this this guy looks good uh, on the outside, but what David sees is that his heart isn't right. David says something's amiss. In the the bringing of this news, there's been a little too much joy. There's, There's been a little too much anticipation of reward. I want to dig a little deeper. Where are you from? And as he begins to ask these questions, you can almost see this Amalekite start to sweat, can't you? I'm about to be found out. He's pinning me against the wall here. David says, where are you from? And 
As he peels back the layers, the man says, I'm an alien. This is important, alien, sojourner. It was a man who was not a Jew, but had settled down with the Israelites. They had become a part of the Israelite nation. Israel was commanded to be kind to aliens and sojourners. Why? Because they knew what it was like to be an alien and sojourner. You be kind to these people. You welcome them in as they seek to know the blessings of God's people. So aliens and sojourners joined up with the people of God. And there's even chance that this, this Amalekite had maybe even been born amongst the Israelites. Been born in Israel. And why is this significant? Why would it be significant to know that he has spent some good measure of time around the Israelite people? Well, it would let David know that this guy is not ignorant of the law of God. He's not ignorant to how we do things. He's been around us long enough to know that you do not touch the Lord's anointed. David has already demonstrated, I don't touch the Lord's anointed. The armor bearer who was with King Saul, he didn't touch the Lord's anointed. He wouldn't do it either. And this guy has been around the people of Israel enough to know better that you don't touch the Lord's anointed. And David now knows. He has knowledge. And he's accountable. Because what he has done is sin. Then in verse 14, then David said to him, how is it that you're not afraid to stretch out your hand and destroy the Lord's anointed? You know what David recognizes? There's no fear of God in this man. He has, uh, he has brought his own righteousness. He's brought his own goodness. He's brought these gifts expecting to earn and gain the favor of the Lord's anointed. But he has no real heart towards God, no real heart of love towards God and his people, no fear of God. You, you weren't afraid and you should have been afraid. Look at verse 15, and David called one of the young men and said, go cut him down. So he struck him and he died. David said to him, your blood is on your head for your mouth has testified against you saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. David looks past this man's posture, his clothing, his language, his testimony. David looks right through him with the eyes of Christ. You remember it says in Revelation 19, Jesus has eyes like flames of fire, meaning he sees right through all your junk. Meaning you can fool a lot of other people, but you can't fool Jesus. And here is David, the Lord's anointed, and he peels back the layers, and he sees past his posture and his language and his, his clothing and his testimony, and he sees his heart that he has no real heart of love towards the Lord's anointed. He has no fear of God in his heart, no real heart of repentance and contrition. And so this man who thought this was a, a righteous act in trying to earn the favor of the Lord's anointed, David sees it as his shame. His claim to enter into the kingdom on the basis of his own righteousness became his chief crime. And so it is here, just as it, as it is in all of Scripture, we have an anticipation of Jesus Christ. As David begins to build his kingdom here, the question is, how do I enter? As you enter in, the people of God throughout the scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, you want to enter in the kingdom of God, is it possible to come on your own righteousness? Is it possible to come in arrogance and pride, trusting and leaning upon your own moral resume? Now, in David's kingdom, in Christ's kingdom, what we have already learned and what we will continue to learn, that entrance is not merit-based, it's mercy-based. Didn't we already see that? You remember when David, he wins the victory, and he's got the spoils of victory, and they come back, and the guys who have held the baggage and didn't go in the war, into the battle, and they said, well, they're not getting anything because they didn't earn it. And David says, no, this kingdom will not be based on what you earned. It'll be based on the grace of God because none of us deserve anything but the wrath of God. David says, this will be the foundation of the kingdom. This will be the entrance into the kingdom. You will come by humility, trusting in the grace of God, or you will not come at all. You don't come bringing a payment. You come knowing you can't make a payment, and you trust in Christ who made the payment for you. You admit you have no righteousness on your own. You trust completely in the righteousness of Christ, and his righteousness is imputed to your account by faith, and you have entrance in the kingdom of God as a saint and a child of God. It's interesting. You put yourself in the shoes of the, the people who are watching 
I think of this, the guys standing around, they're watching this. Uh, David's men and his army, his officials, they're watching this, and they're probably thinking, the guy looks pretty good, David. I mean, he's grievy, he's normal, he's humble, he's contritious, um, he's, he, he admitted. And see, they don't know what actually happened. Mercy killer, seems pretty good to me. And then David says, no, he's going to die. And I bet that David's men are starting to wonder, this King David's got a pretty high standard. And uh, I'm just going to be honest with you. If this, guy don't make it, if this guy dies, we might be dying too. You remember C.S. Lewis, Lion, Witch of the Wardrobe? And um, uh, they said, if, if anyone who approaches Aslan without their knees knocking is either braver than most or they're just downright silly. And do you remember what Lucy says? Miss, Lucy says, Mrs. B, is he not safe? And you remember Mrs. Beaver says, who said anything about him being safe? No, he's not safe, but he is good. David is demonstrating the righteousness of God that, listen, if you come on the basis of your own merit, if you come thinking you're going to impress him with your moral character and the things you've done, he is a God to be feared. Because it won't cut the weight with him. It's confederate money. It's fool's gold. It holds no weight with him. But if you will come in humility and repentance and faith, there is grace and there is forgiveness and there's mercy. And he says, come on, come into my kingdom. You remember Jesus the same way in his ministry. The rich young ruler comes trying to impress Jesus with all of his moral character. And he's lying through his teeth. And Jesus says, sell everything you got. Meaning, Wealth was a sign of your righteousness. You got to lay all, all your righteousness, lay it down. You have to say it's rubbish. Like Paul said, all the things that were gained to me, my moral character, my righteousness, it's loss. It's, it's, it's scuba on. It's rubbish. And you remember the rich young ruler, he grieves and walks away. He doesn't want to let go of his own righteousness. And you remember, Jesus says to the disciples, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom. And guess what they say? That guy looks pretty good to me. If he doesn't get in, who does? If I told you today, in order to get to heaven, you gotta be fast. You gotta be really fast. And you said, well, how fast do I gotta be? What if I told you, Usain Bolt, he's not fast enough. You would say, then we're all doomed. But folks, that's the point. We are all doomed. If we got to enter on our own righteousness, we're all in a bad spot. But that's the point. In your own righteousness, no one gets in. But if you trust the righteousness of Christ, it's open to anyone. That's the picture that's being painted here on the front End of David's reign. You want to enter into this kingdom. You want to be a part of God's kingdom. You got to come in humility and repentance. If this man had come saying, I'm a descendant of Esau, I'm an Edomite, I'm an Amalekite, and I come bearing bad news, I've seen it with my own eyes, and I, I am guilty as well, and I deserve death, and I don't deserve anything, David, I'm just, I'm just trusting you're a merciful king. I think the story would have had a much different ending. But he'll come in pride and he'll be cut down Listen to me, if you're coming in pride and arrogance thinking you're gonna press God, listen to me, he's not safe. But if you'll come in humility and repentance, he's really good. I don't know about you, but my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. I'm wholly leaning on Jesus' name, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground, listen to me today, it's sinking sand. Father, we thank you for your word this morning that even in this Old Testament passage at the beginning of 2 Samuel, we, we find the way unto your kingdom. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here, maybe they've never really thought about it, but they're thinking about it right now because we're all gonna face you one day, but maybe they think that somehow they're gonna bring their moral righteousness, they're gonna bring all their good works, maybe they're gonna bring their gifts and their talents, their ability, and somehow they're gonna impress you. Lord, I pray that they would know today there's no good work or act of righteousness in their own life and in their own power that could ever impress you. We are far too sinful. You are far too holy. I pray that you would show them the death of their sin. I pray that you'd show them the beauty of Christ who died in their place. I pray that they would run to you. They'd know your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness. 
Lord, that for those of us that do know you, I pray that we would always be reminded we're nothing more than sinners saved by grace. We entered into this kingdom not on the basis of our merit, but on the basis of his mercy. To God be the glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.